the numbers, two places in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 11, Numbers chapter 21. Now, I was surprised to see so many hands up here tonight, uh, newcomers, this kind of thing, and uh, I guess that's right. <laughs> that's probably just as well. <laughs> and uh, you get you get probably a little bit shocked tonight by what you're going to hear. <laughs> Fellow said to me one time, he said, "You know, if I talk like you talk and use the language you use, somebody would probably take a shot at me." And I told him, "Listen," I said, "If I talk the way I talk and use the language I do use." and don't have the spirit I have, God had killed me 32 years ago. <laughs> the thing is, some of those fellows just got a bad spirit. That's the problem. If you got the right spirit, you can get away with all kinds of things. <laughs> I've been trying to get up in that fundamentalist conference up in uh, that, that Baptist Fundamental Congress up in, uh, in Washington. I want to come. Uh, all my friends are going to be there. I mean, <laughs> Why, well, sure, man, he's going to be there, and Brother Bob Gray and all these fellows I've been preaching for. Strange, I've been trying for three months to get a ticket, they won't send me a ticket. <laughs> I sent them a check, man, they haven't even cashed the check yet. Well, I thought it was a chair, but we don't want any <laughs> <laughs> If I get in, they'll probably put me at a table by myself, you know. <laughs> And have a big sign there saying, unclean, unclean. <laughs> well, I couldn't care any less. <laughs> all right, now let's look at two places here. First of all, Numbers chapter 11, verse 20. Numbers chapter 21, verse 5. Now, both these verses say substantially the same thing, but they say it in a different way. And one of these, in one of these passages here, the children of Israel are complaining, and they're asking, why came we forth out of Egypt? They want to know why they did it. Then the other passage, they're saying, why has the Lord God, why has God brought it forth out of the land of Egypt, that we may die in this wilderness? Now, both those places there show when the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt, they uh, began to murmur and gripe and complain, got real and happy and put out with the Lord, and they lost the joy. A text says, one of those texts says, why came we forth out of Egypt? Have you ever asked yourself that question? You know, if you know any Bible at all, you know Egypt the type of this world, you know that. If you know any Bible at all, you know Egypt the type of this world, and uh, the wilderness, a picture of the, the wandering, you know, and then there's a victory over in, in Canaan, you know, in the Christian warfare and that kind of thing. That's two types. I hear scholars sometimes try to limit to one, but it's two types. It's a picture of being saved and the wilderness journey and then death and going home to glory. It's a picture of being saved and the wilderness wanderings and victory in the battle. There's two kinds in there. But you take that thing coming out of the land of Egypt. Egypt's a picture of this world. And when God saved you, the first thing he did was wash you in the blood of the Lamb. That's Exodus chapter 20. Next thing he did, if you were willing, was he baptized you. You were immersed. Moses and them went out through the water in the cloud. Exodus chapter 15. Then you get out there in the wilderness, and when you begin your wilderness journey, sometimes you begin to wonder, why came we forth out of Egypt? Uh, haven't things happened in Christian service that have discouraged you desperately? Do you know the, the, the finest men in the world are Christians, and the meanest men in the world are Christians? Do you know that? If you don't know that, you haven't been saved very long. I'm of the finest people in God's earth to save men. And some of them are some of the meanest devils you ever in all your life. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. If you don't believe that, you haven't been saved very long. All right, now I'm going to talk tonight about why came we forth out of the land of Egypt. Now, first of all, God Almighty brought you out of the land of Egypt to make you joyful. Joyful. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. I write these things to you that your joy may be full. You are joyful, joy unspeakable, and full of glory. Why, the, you don't read about anybody singing in the Bible till they cross the Red Sea. And the first song they sing, they sing when they cross the Red Sea, because they're happy. Christian lose the joy. You have no right to be gloomy. Now, you may have a right to worry and be down and, you know, discouraged and this, not, but not gloomy. Uh, I've got a right to be. For me, it's a normal, it's a normal condition. 
I mean, I stay in a very low key all the time, see, and I very rise, very seldom rise above the gutter, just about a foot above it, see, but you couldn't stand the pace I stand. So you blow your brains out. Now listen, what you need to do is catch you a few metal larks and take that old hoot owl down your soul and shoot him. <laughs> Satan loves to burrow in a dark closet full of rats. And some of you people here tonight, you're just not cheerful and you ought to be cheerful. Now, I'm, I'm not going to pull out on you. If you just buried your mother and uh, they got you down there for manslaughter in a car and you got terminal cancer, I'm not saying you ought to be run down this aisle, you know, jumping and climbing the building or anything. I'm not saying that. But the thing is, when you lose your joy, you lost plenty. Because that Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. God Almighty's people ought to have joy. Joy, 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 joy down deep in my heart. Old James McGinley said, I'd rather be a janitor of a candy store than president of a pickle factory. A lot of truth in that. God's people lose the joy and don't have the joy. Do you ever think about how God does things? God didn't make nature black. Oh, uh, you, you, you'll go up in the springtime and find black trees and black grass and look over your head and see, you know, brown clouds and brown sunshine, you know. Why, it's, the Lord's cheerful. Do you ever see how the Lord robes nature and, co and colors nature up? The Lord's a cheerful soul. You can tell by looking at his creation. And God has more mind his people ought to be cheerful. You ought to get rid of this stuff. One time a little old Scotch girl said to a man, she was a blind little girl, she said to a man, God has mistreated me. She said, I was born blind. But she said, I hear beautiful sounds and I smell beautiful smells and hear the birds in the springtime. And the Lord speaks to my heart. She said, I don't feel like God mistreated me. And yet some of you feel like God mistreated you, don't you? Trouble is with you, trouble is some of you, you're lazy. You have your doubts because you're lazy. You're gloomy because you sit around and think too much. Get the thing in gear and get the thing going, you get rid of some of your doubts. One of the, one of the sweetest souls ever lived in the face of this earth was Billy Bray. And Billy Bray was no theologian. I mean, he was an old uh, Welsh coal miner, and he was a character. But that fellow was rejoicing all the time. He was always having a good time and praising God one way or another. And that old boy, he'd been, he'd been known to be on his way to get a doctor for a sick girl of his who was dying. And with his last 37 cents, gave it away to a fellow who lost a cow and was crying about it. And when he didn't have money to see the doctor, he said, I might as well not see the doctor because I can't pay him anyway. So he just jumped over a hedge there and said, well, I'll just praise God anyway and see what happens. And just jumped over the hedge and praised God went back home and the girl was well. Now, I'm not saying that oh, is always going to work. But that shows your frame of mind, see. And some of you sure need that frame of mind. Uh, don't, don't, don't tell me you don't believe in it. I mean, you Yankees up here, and, and half Yankees cross the river down there, <laughs> when you have basketball up here, you go cuckoo. I mean, nuts. Just nutty as a fruitcake. I've seen pictures of high school teams and college teams up here in Indiana and Ohio and Illinois. That's where it is. Ohio and Illinois and Indiana still play basketball. You know, point, 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 tweet, point, 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 tweet, point, 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 tweet. I never could stand that game. <laughs> I'll bet you, I'll bet you the best basketball games are played out in the driveways when there's no umpire, no referee. Yeah. I bet those are good games. But those college games and programs, think, 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 tweet, think, 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 tweet, let the guy shoot. <laughs> and stop him when he shoots. The idea is stop him. Grab his leg. <laughs> you know, I mean, hit him in the gut when he goes up, but don't even put the ball in the thing. <laughs> Did you ever have a hockey score of 93 to 90? <laughs> now, you know, when you go to a fight, a hockey game breaks out. <laughs> and, those, and those fellas there, they move. They move. But you look at the basketball games, I've seen pictures of little high school girls screaming, pulling the hair, crying. What a thing, man. What a thing. Last minute, got one second, the guy's got the ball in the air that makes it. <laughs> oh, shut your mouth, you fool. Now, you know why some of you don't like that? 
It's because the world has got your joy and God doesn't have it. You don't get up and yell like that when somebody gets saved. You don't get up and yell like that when you find a verse in the Bible that, that, that gives you light. You just yell when some dummy runs down a bunch of wood and beep, pokes it in. He's not throwing anyway. He's tall in the basket, man, just drops it down in the middle of it. They'll make out a worthwhile game, put that basket up to 14 feet and get the game back on the... That's right, man. Then have a rule and the guy goes up, you can get him by the ankle, you know, or you can something. <laughs> make it interesting, brother. <laughs> Same way with the baseball. I, I have never watched a baseball game nine innings. I couldn't do it. That game just puts me to sleep, man. Just puts me to sleep. Don't have something where when the guy takes off, the, the batter can throw the, the, the bat at the pitcher... Now, when he gets to the first base, the first baseman can tackle him with a shortstop or something like that. They're laving the thing up. But folks don't watch those games. They scream and holler and have them a time, and they, they, they've lost their joy for the Lord. Heaven isn't real, though. Salvation isn't real, though. Something wrong. Listen, God brought you out of Egypt. The reason he brought you out was to give you joy and rejoicing. Now, there's something else about it. He brought you out to make you praise him. The Lord brought you out so you could praise him. The first time you find a song and dance in that Bible is when Miriam comes out the other side of the Red Sea and the women go out after with timbrels and dances. And they sing, praise the Lord for the horse and rider at the overthrown into the sea. They praise God. Billy Bray again, for example. You know what he did? That old fellow one time had saved up a pound note for about ten years because one of his other kid was dying. He wanted to have it for a funeral. And right before that kid was going to die, he took that pound note and gave that pound note to a Methodist chapel, a little, little old chapel out there in the hills of Wales. And the girl got well and grew up and married and had about seven kids. That old boy just made a habit of praising God when it got real rough. He'd run out of potatoes and stick his head down the potato barrel and yell, Praise God! Down the potato barrel. <laughs> in an empty barrel, and then get up and be a knock at the door, and a guy come by, Billy, I just felt the Lord leave me this way, don't know what it is, but got a bushel of potatoes out here, want to have your hand. Don't lose your praise, don't lose your joy. Why'd God bring you out of the land of Egypt? To make you praise him. Take time to praise him. You say, well, they're up and I'm miserable. Well, praise him when you're miserable. You say, I think go with you. Oh, well, fine, go and find me. I got hit by a stingray about two years ago, and a chainsaw hit me in the mouth and the upper lip. Had to have some stitches. A ball hit me in the left eye, and the pupil hadn't come back down. The right knee got arthritis, and the tore the ligaments the left one. Doing fine. Great. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Great to be saved, isn't it? Amen. That's the business. God Almighty saved you to get you to praise him. You know what Bob Jones used to say? He used to say, you could never get completely comfortable on this earth. And I believe that. Have if you're waiting where everything just gets comfortable and hunky-dory before you praise God, you're sure going to have a long wait. Nothing's ever right. It's never right. You go down to the airplane and the computer gets the wrong seat, gets the wrong time. The bags don't come in. You get there in the seat, the seat doesn't lean back. Okay, you get a seat to lean back, you can't get your bag under it. Okay, you get your bag under it, somebody sits down next to you, weighs 450 pounds, and they come over, they, they, they blob over you across in the arm seat where you're sitting. Yeah, you get to a motel, the pillow isn't right, the bed sheet isn't right, the blanket isn't right, the air condition. My God, people, if you wait till you're comfortable, you'll never praise God. Just get in the habit, just praising God morning, noon, and night when everything's falling apart. Won't kill you. People ask me, how'd you sleep in a motel? I say, fine, I got up and rested one or two, three times. <laughs> I, don't, I don't sleep good in motels. I've had to sleep in motels all my life. I don't like any motel. And I get treated right. I get put in the best motels in the country. I've stayed in the Marriott and all those places, and the Shelton and all those places, and the, the Hilton hotels and all the stuff. I don't, care. I don't care what they are. Something's wrong. Something's always wrong. By the time I've been in a room for about eight or nine hours, I'm ready to climb the wall, man. I get, I wait till about 11 o'clock at night and put on a pair of sweatpants, get out there on the highway on my bare feet and run that highway till about 12 o'clock at night. I can't stand them rooms. You say, what do you do? Praise God, brother. Praise God. If you're not comfortable, God Almighty brought you out to praise Him. If you don't praise Him, then something's wrong. God, people always griping, always complaining. Something's always wrong. Well, sure, it's always wrong. 
fellow sitting one time under an oak tree with uh, Sam Jones, old-time Methodist preacher. I like Sam. I borrow out of his stuff. Nothing he ever wrote I couldn't use if I could came out of my mouth. And he was sitting under this oak tree, and this guy was complaining and saying, well, you're talking about God this and God that. I don't think God's got very good sense. And Sam said, well, why not? And the fellow said, well, looky here. See this? Here's this little acorn up here. And here's this great big oak tree. Look at the side of this thing. And here it holds up this little oak acorn about that big. And he said, it takes a tree like that to take care of an acorn. And here's a watermelon down there. It's that big. And it's got a little old skinny old vine on it that you can bust with your fingers. Now, does that look like good sense to you? And about that time, an acorn dropped out of that tree and hit that fellow in the head. <laughs> and Sam said, Ain't you glad that watermelons don't grow old trees? <laughs> I mean, I mean, the Lord knows what he's doing. Folks talk about, you know, Darwin, you know, how, 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 how Mother Nature did this and Mother Nature did that, and Darwin said it worked out accidentally. I don't believe all that bunk. I don't believe that bunk. I mean, why didn't nature put your nose on upside down? <laughs> Would that be somewhere? So what if your nose just accidentally got upside down? Every time you sneeze, you blow your hat off, and every time it rains, <laughs> every time it rains, you drown. Wouldn't that be something? I mean, somebody had a plan in there. Or oh, God Almighty brought you out, and he brought you out there to get you to praise his name. That is no. The Lord brought you out to show you his grace. That Bible says, by grace you say through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. One time back there in England, back in the 18th century, a little old boy came to an orphan house and tried to get in on a cold, windy night. We knocked at the door. They came to him, and he said he wanted to get in, get taken care of. And they said, what are your credentials? And he pointed to his clothes and said, ain't these rags credentials enough? <laughs> you know what our credentials are? You know what we have to show God to show we deserve his grace? Filthy rags. Amen. Ain't these rag credentials enough? The Son of Man came to save sinners. You a sinner? He came to save you. You know why I got him out of Egypt? To show that it was grace. None of them deserved to get out. They didn't live like a devil down there. How you going to be living like a devil down there? But how they acted when they got out. They hadn't been out, they hadn't been out there a year, and they're going back to a golden calf. How come the Lord popped up there suddenly and said, You know something that'd be like? You stand out there, a bunch of folks, not mixed multitude, and you've been committing adultery with somebody's wife, and that voice comes off that mountain and says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Boy, that'd set your hair, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, that voice is coming out of fire at them. Well, you just stole somebody's what, see, like they've been doing down there in Egypt. And that voice came out and said, Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> Why, you know those folks are living like the devil because God had to give them those commandments to show them the condition they were in. They didn't even know the condition they were in. Saved by grace through faith. You, you have been saved. <clears throat> you have been saved. You are saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't been saved that way, you've never been saved. You just had something else. One time there in Congress a couple of years back, a senator got up and the chaplain wasn't in Congress and requested the right to asked for prayer, and the House Speaker said, By what right does the Senator from Mississippi ask for prayer? And the Senator said, The right of any sinner in trouble. <laughs> That's your rights. You want your civil rights? That's your civil rights. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's your rights. One time a preacher was uh, in a barber shop witnessing the barber and getting nowhere, going around and around, not getting much anywhere. And finally, he said to the barber, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, why don't you let me, uh, you don't like my preaching? He said, why don't you let me cut hair for a while and you preach? And the barber said, are you serious? He said, yes. And the barber said, well, you couldn't give him a haircut. He said, yeah, but I could try. I'd do my best. And the barber said, yeah, but that wouldn't do for my customers. See, that's profound. You've got to think about that for a while. Um, you may do your best to get to heaven, but it won't do. It won't do. It won't do. The best you can do won't do. It won't please the Lord. He's got to do it. Amen. That, book, that book says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. God Almighty did that to show you his grace and his love. That isn't all. 
I'll tell you another reason God brought you out of Egypt. My, my text says, wherefore, I mean, why have we come out of Egypt? Wherefore the Lord bring us out here to die in this wilderness? Well, they didn't die in the wilderness. The Lord uh, got them out. The only ones that died in the wilderness the ones that rebelled. And you take that business right there. The Lord did that thing to show it could be done. One time Moses got on his knees for the Lord, and he said, Lord, you need to repent of your fierce anger. Imagine God telling God to repent. And the Lord repented of his fierce anger. The Lord said to Moses one time, he said, tell you what, he said, you get out of the way and let me out of them, and I'll kill every cotton picking one of them, I'll make a greater nation out of you, and go on with you. And Moses said to the Lord, don't do that. The Lord said, why not? Moses said, because then those folks down in Egypt say you weren't able to do what you said you were going to do. And you said you take those folks out of Egypt and get them in the wilderness, they'll make fun of you and say, you see there, he couldn't do it. Well, I read a passage in the Bible one time, Deuteronomy chapter 32. I guess I've read it many times before. I noticed it this the 91st time going through there, where the Lord said, Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy? And that was God speaking in the first person. What's God doing being scared of anybody? God said, Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy? My passage, you know what he's talking about? The Lord is saying, I'm worried about what the devil would say if I didn't get you folks home. And that's why I'm going to get you home. Amen. Lord, give you a promise of eternal life, you're going to make it. Amen. This is the record. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. You got it. Amen. God Almighty is going to get you home, and if for no other reason, just to shut the devil's mouth. There's some other reasons, but that's one of them right there. To show that it can be done. What could be more improbable, I ask you? What could be more improbable than taking 600,000 men plus women and children? Man, do you realize what that is? That's nearly 2 million people. You couldn't get less than a million five hundred thousand if you estimated conservatively. Imagine taking that bunch of people, a, a, a bunch that size, and taking them out in the Semiotic Peninsula and getting through there for 40 years and feeding them every day. Why, it can't be done. Did you teach you want to have some fun? You go home at night and you get you a square and put a square and sheet of paper and then figure 500,000 people on this side of the square, 500,000 on that, 500,000 that, and 500,000 on that. I mean, two million people, and they were encamped around the tabernacle, north, south, east, and west. 500,000. Two million. How big is Cincinnati? How many population is Cincinnati about? About three quarters of a million? All right, then figure two cities the size of Cincinnati going through the Sinaitic Peninsula. Why, it can't be done. How do you feed them every day with manna, dropping bread every day to feed that bunch? But the Lord did it. You know why God brought you out of Egypt? To show that it can be done. Uh, you know, it, it's been a long time since uh, I was a poverty-stricken and lived down in the ghetto and uh, went through the, uh, the great blast of poverty they keep talking about, but I've been along there. I've been along there. I mean, I've been $30 a week with a wife and two kids and a used plywood trailer. I get, I get a kind of a bad conscience sometime down home because I'm a rich man now. I mean, comparatively speaking. I've got a three-bedroom house and a couple of cars, you know, and a boat and all that world of junk. You know, I've got a big old fishing net and a bunch of shotguns. I'm not worldly, man. Lord been good to me. Acre of land, you know, plum trees, pear trees, got uh, oak trees on it, and has uh, blueberry bushes on it, and all kinds of stuff. But it wasn't always that way. And I could see my young men sitting out there, know they're living off graham crackers and sardines and rice. I know what's going on. I've been along there. I've been that plywood trailer man stuffing blankets in the window to keep the frost out. I mean, after I graduated from college, after I was a grown man, you, you know, you're, you're not, you're not going to preach to me about it. I'll preach you about it. I don't have the, we didn't even have a bathroom in that trailer, man. We used a communal bathroom. We didn't have any hot running water. We warmed it on a kerosene heater. I mean, I'm talking about after I got my degree. And the Lord called me to preach. I've been along there. And you taking going through things like that, you know what I've often wondered looking back in those days? I've, I've said to myself, how, how, how could God Almighty ever get us through a thing like that? I watched some of our young men that I had trained their family, just poor kids. 
I mean, they come down up here to make eight, nine, ten dollars an hour. They come down there and they're making two and three dollars an hour. Some of them got four or five kids, you know, and a wife, and the wife's sick, you know, and the wife has a miscarriage, and one of the babies has meningitis, and the car breaks down. I've seen some of our kids walking to that school five miles in the rain, picked them up on the highway. And I've said to myself, how, do, how, does, how can God ever do it? I feel constrained sometimes to sell our have and just give them all the money and tell them to go and enjoy themselves. <laughs> but God can do it. I know he did it. Because I've seen him do it with me. Listen, man, when I was 40 years old, your pastor was my friend through all that mess. When I was 40 years old, I was reduced to a used trailer and a car at 40, and that's all I had in this earth at 40. After eight years in the ministry, I lived to see the time where I had two houses a school, a church, a boat, three automobiles, seven kids, and seven grandchildren. Don't you tell me it can't be done. I seen him do it. And you know, I, I was up one time in a little church in Pennsylvania, and a family asked me to come out and eat in downtown Philadelphia. Well, I don't like downtown Philadelphia. I don't like downtown nothing. <laughs> I'm like Dave Garner, you know. I think there's nothing wrong with uh, you. Nothing wrong with uh, with a uh, nothing uh, thing wrong with the world, you know. But the cities. But I went down that home there, and we went up some little old back bunch of stairways, up three flights up in the air, and the little narrow houses. You know the houses on those places. I'm all right together in the front yard. is a cement sidewalk about six feet long, two flower pots sitting there. The backyard is about twenty feet long, ten feet wide, with a garbage can in it. And if they're facing north, they don't get any sunlight all day long. And I was up in there going up those creaky steps up that Christian apartment deep with this young couple. They loved the Lord, wanted to have me over. I'm sure it wouldn't be much of a meal, you know, but uh, I decided to go with them, and, you know, they, it seemed to mean something to them, so I went up to meet with them up there. And I remember going up those stairs and thinking to myself, my God, I couldn't live in a place like this. It would drive me crazy. I said, how in the world can people live in a dump like this? Then I got up there in that little old rickety apartment, little old Kmart furniture around there, and throw a rug on the floor, and she's cooking, the baby is crying, baby had a cold or something over there, and had vaporizer going in the room, and I looked over in the corner, here's this pile of records, you know, Christian music. Over in this corner, a pile of magazines, Christian magazines. Over in this table was a Bible. Up here around the table were signs on the wall, my God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ for strength that is me. We know that all things work together for good. You know what those folks had? That little bit of heaven cut off and put right down in the midst of that mess, and God was in that place, boy. God was in that place. And listen, a place like that with God in it is better than a 15-room house without God in it. Now you put that to your pipe and smoke it. Some of these folks around here making a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year and got all this stuff, think they got it made. You ain't got it made if you don't have God, bud. I've drawn the L road, driven on the LA freeway, and boy, what a, what a thing, man, what a thing. You can smell the acid coming in through the air conditioner. <laughs> that, 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 that grass out there is kind of a dirty gray. <laughs> and you drive along there, back in the old days, there was no speed limit. And uh, I, I learned how to, I cut my teeth in the LA freeway. I'm in the first lane, no 70, and the fast lane, 85, and the fast lane, the other one. I don't see how a patrolman got on there back in the old days. But you get going out of that thing, you see a sign, Pomona, 45,000, Bernardino, 100,000, uh, uh, Beverly Hills, 200,000. You drive about every 10 miles to the sign, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, 7 million people in there. I get thinking about that, and I said to myself, boy, am I glad God didn't call me out to that mess. And I get looking at that thing and driving down that thing, and I, I'm suddenly aware of the fact that all along that freeway back in those houses, they're young Christian couple just been saved, trying to start a Christian family and start a Christian home and start out in life, and they got Christian homes back there. And listen, it can't be done. It's impossible. It'd be impossible to raise a family in Las Vegas that love God. It'd be impossible. But the Lord does it. <laughs> he does it. 
I know a Baptist church out there called Paradise Baptist Church. What a name, man. Right in the middle of Las Vegas. Brother Matovich, uh, he's a pastor from Brother Mondish's church up in, uh, in uh, Rochester. He got a fine work, go premium under the work, got fine Christian people there who love the Lord and believe the book. Right in the middle of that hellhole, man. If it weren't for porn pornography and gambling and prostitution, Las Vegas wouldn't even be there. They haven't got any industries. They've got gambling, prostitution, and pornography. <laughs> That's all they got. How could God use anybody out of there? I don't know, but I know he does it. You know why God brought you out of the land of Egypt? He brought you out of the land of Egypt to show the world and show the devil and show you that it could be done. And maybe you didn't believe at the time, but uh, it can be done. The Lord assured it to you that it can be done. Why came we forth out of the land of Egypt? Well, God Almighty brought you out of the land of Egypt to demonstrate his power and wrath upon those that stayed in Egypt. I mean, the ones that stayed there, the death angel got them. It didn't... Death angel got them. It didn't uh, apply the blood. That isn't all. The ones that came out got drowned trying to come after them and attack them. Uh, God Almighty did that much out of the land of Egypt to show you two things. First of all, his power and his wrath will remain upon those that stay down in Egypt, down there in the world system. And secondly, those that come out and try to usurp the authority of God's leadership and God's power, the wrath going to get them too. Oh, Dathan and the bottom of that bunch rose up and they said, well, we're just as anointed as Moses is. That was true. And they said, we're just as holy as he is, and that was true, but they weren't called to lead. You assert the, the, authority, the authority of leadership, you'll get the wrath of God on you, tear you up. What could be more improbable than taking... Do you ever start thinking about these things? I think Moses, I think Moses was by far and away the greatest pastor in the Bible. Now, maybe the New Testament epistles have something more about pastoring than... Uh, what you find in, in uh, Deuteronomy and Exodus and Numbers, but I never found it. If I want to pick a pastor who did the job, I would pick uh, Moses. But I thank God Brother Hiles has a large work and talks about 14,000 and 17,000 Sunday school and doing the best he can. Thank God he's doing what he can, but that's no church alongside Moses. Moses had two million members. Two million took him out of the convention. <laughs> Isn't that something? Take two million members out of the convention and start out there and had it in our place where nobody could take care of them but God, and God took care of them. And what happened? Wrath and power fell upon the rest. Now, you folks that are in love with the world, love not the world, neither the things of the world, all the new world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, is not in the Father, but the world, and the world with the lust thereof passed away, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You folks that are in love with the world want to hang out with the world like Demas who hath forsaken Paul, having loved this present world. I want to tell you something. The fashion of this world passeth away. The fashion of this world passeth away. It'll go up in a mushroom cloud one of these days. I'll tell you, if it doesn't go up very soon, I don't think it'll go up soon. I think all that nuclear scare, I know, I know my Bible, isn't going up in a, and isn't going up in fire until after the millennium. This world, this universe may have never begun with the Big Bang, but it's going to end with the Big Bang. I believe in that. I'm a great believer in destructive disintegration. <laughs> yes, sir, man. I, well, I'm with a German man. I don't think the an answer is integration. I don't think it's segregation. I think it's disintegration. <laughs> <laughs> in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. I believe that, brother. And you got your roots in the world and your heart in the world, you know what's going to happen? It's going to blow up on you. God's going to do it. You say, brother, don't rough and I don't like that kind of talk. Doesn't make them whether you like it or not, it's going to go. You get talking to people about Noah's day and about that flood coming down and drowning all those little old babies. And this did drown those folks, 80 and 90, hobble around on crushes, and it drowned the people in the hospital. And when the wrath of God came down there in Noah's day, nobody escaped. They all drowned. God no respect for persons. So it's just one of those Bible stories, Brother Ruppin. God wouldn't do a thing like that. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Listen, along about 1917, a ship called the Mount Blanc uh, came alongside some piers near Richmond, loaded with uh, gun cotton and benzoil and TNT, and that ship caught a fire. 
and they tried to get that ship straightened out, and it wouldn't get straightened out, began to drift toward the shore, and that crew abandoned that ship, and that ship came drifting like a floating sepulcher into Pier 8 off Virginia coast, and 600 people went down there to watch it come in, watch it burning, and we got right to the pier, exploded. I mean, just blew up all over the place. The thing blew up, that, that, that blast could be heard 52 miles away, there were 1,300 dead, 400 missing. They were picking up body of pieces of bodies for 40, 40 days after that thing went off. And folks said, God wouldn't do a thing like that. Yeah, but he let it happen. You say, how do you know? Because it happened. <laughs> See, these fools live in a dream world. Oh, God wouldn't. You don't know what God would do. He let it happen. You take, you talk to folks about Sodom and Gomorrah and God Almighty letting the unchecked lust of those people kindle a fire in their bosom and burn their city down and burn it down the lake of fire where it's still burning today, according to Jude. You take that bunch, you talk about that fire falling, I guarantee you, uh, Mike Wallace and 50 Minutes and Perspective and all that jazz, I bet they weren't down there covering that thing in the news beat when that fire came down. An old man, 80 and 90 years old, their flesh was turning to water and dripping fat and turning red and bubbling and screaming. Little babies were screaming, Mama, 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 I'm burning. You say, God wouldn't do that. He did it. He did it. I get sick and tired of these sentimental humanists that don't believe a God will hurt a flea. He'll do more than hurt a flea. Let me tell you, that atom bomb went off at Hiroshima. He blew that thing sky high and killed them young and old, so lame and crippled, sick and healthy and wealthy alike. You say, God would do a thing like that. He did it. You say, man did it. Don't give me that jazz. The Lord could have stopped it, couldn't he? You believe in God, do you? You deists that are here tonight? Well, if God's all-powerful, he could have stopped it, couldn't he? Well, he didn't. If God's all-powerful, he could have stopped the devil, couldn't he? But he didn't. If God's all-powerful, he could have kept Adam from sinning, amen? Well, he didn't. Don't you be presumptuous about what God would do or what God wouldn't do. God takes suicide and burn it to the ground tonight with everything it breathes in it. You better get out. You know, Father, you do. I would get out. Out. You say, out of what? Out of this world system, man. Out of Egypt. Out of Egypt I have traveled through the darkness dreary. That's the business. You say, well, I don't think God would do a thing like that. Yes, he did. Yes, he would. 9.55, June the 11th, Saturday, Le Mans race over there in Stuttgart. Some Englishman driving a Jaguar missed his uh, pit stop and couldn't get his car right. And some French in the Mercedes Benz came in and sailed in the back end of an Austin Healey. And that Mercedes Benz came apart and the engine came out and that thing went over the thing into the grandstand with the engine and the motor loose from that thing and the petrol tanks on fire and that blade sailing through there and that cooler cutting off heads, 82 people killed, about 20 of them decapitated. That thing going through there and priests kneeling in the blood of people there, giving them the last rites, and people screaming, oh my mother, oh my daughter, oh my God, and people fading, wading around in blood, and that accordion up in the PA system just playing away. That's the world. That's the world. You know what they're doing tonight? They're beating that thing to beat the band, boy. Solid gold rock, man. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you're going to burn like a torch, man. You're going to burn like a torch. God Almighty brought you out to show that his power and wrath was on those who stayed or those who usurped authority. And finally, and finally, you see what's over here on the, you're drawn on this side. Well, you know what this is? This is Beulah Land. As on the highest bank I stand. <laughs> if you're saved, you get out. That's the important thing, getting out. <laughs> Don't die down in the hog pen in Egypt. Get out. Why did God Almighty bring you out of the land of Egypt? Well, finally, and you might have well known this from the very start of the message, God Almighty brought you out of the land of Egypt to get you home to Canaan. God is determined by his grace to bring many sons to glory and made the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And God is determined he's going to get you home and he's going to get you home come hell or high water. If you're saved here sitting tonight, the devil's got you down the mouth and defeated and whipped. And he may, 
Uh, may, maybe you'll worry to the end, and maybe you'll have good cause. You won't have good cause in God's sight. Even, even an unsaved man knows that people shouldn't worry. Unsaved people tell by their proverbs that they know a person has no right to worry. Unsaved people say there are two things you never should worry about. And they say, what's that? What you can help and what you can't help. <laughs> See, because what you can help, you shouldn't be worrying about, you should fix. And what you can help, it don't do you no good to worry about anyway. It's just like a rocking chair with a lot of motion, but you don't get anywhere. <laughs> now you take, you take even unsaved people, they know that, see? They know it's wrong to worry. But I'm not going to be hard on you. I mean, I'm a human being. I know how things go. I know what lies ahead. Hospital bed is taxes and death. That's what's coming up. Amen, amen. That's what's coming up the Lord tarries, and you better believe it. So if you're down in the mouth about some of those things, maybe, well, maybe the... Maybe the Lord uh, get pretty rough with you, but I'm not going to be rough with you. I'm just going to tell you this. If you're saved, you're going to get home. So you might as well praise God a little while you're here, so later when you get up there, you won't be sorry you didn't. Dwight Moody went down the street one time in Chicago and saw a fellow sitting on a porch of a house there, his wife with him. He just noticed that very radiant space as they waved at him. So I went up in the porch for a minute to introduce himself. They said, we know you. We, we come to your church once in a while. And he said, well, I just thought I'd drop by and say hello. They say, so glad you did. Come in the house for just a minute. And they came inside there, and the fellow told his wife to excuse herself for a minute, and she did. And the man went back in the bedroom and got a picture of an eight-year-old girl, a beautiful little girl. Brought that thing back in and showed it to Dwight L. Moody. And he said, uh, isn't she a pretty little girl? And Moody said, well, yeah, she's, she's beautiful. Whose girl is it? And he said, uh, my little girl. And Moody said, well, wonderful. Is she here today? And the man said, no, she's dead, and God took her, and I just thank God that she's dead. And Moody was kind of puzzled for a minute and said, well, I, I don't quite understand that. Why would you thank God for taking a precious little child like that? And the man said this. The man said, I'm saved. So I've been saved for a long time. So my wife saved. And he said, I was uh, going to church and serving God. And he said, uh, I got bitter at God because I couldn't get the job I wanted. But I got fired from the job I had. And I got more mad at God and began to get put out with God. And he said, then my little girl got sick. My doctors told me she might die. And he said, I told God, God, if that little girl dies, I'm never going to church again. I'm never going to read my Bible again. I'm never going to serve you again. If that little girl dies, you take that little girl. And he said, the Lord took her. And he said, I went to the funeral, I didn't cry. My wife stood at the casket and wept her eyes out, and she turned to me coming home and said, Tim, you're not doing God right, you're not treating God right, you can't act like this, God's going to deal with you, you can't treat God like you're treating him. And he said, I said, keep your mouth shut. He said, I didn't cry at the funeral, so I didn't cry when I got home. He said, lay down my bed, face like stone, heart like stone. And he said, I got in kind of a trance or something, fell asleep, had a dream. Here's what he dreamt. He dreamt that he got up in a flat, rocky stretch of barren land like West Texas, and was going along there, the sun burning and thirsty. About that time he heard rushing water, and he ran toward it. And after about two miles, he came over the edge of a press up there and saw a valley below him, got down in it. It was a beautiful river running down there. He couldn't get across it. Russian cataract. On the other side was a waterfall. And he said, in that dream, he said, Brother Moody, he said, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ come down that waterfall, walk up the bank, and wave at me. And he said, are you coming over? And I said, no. And the Lord showed me his hands and his feet and said, you see what I did for you? You know about this. He said, you didn't appreciate this? You don't love me anymore after what I did for you? And the dream, he said, I said, no. And he said in the dream about that time, he said, my little girl showed up, eight years old, right behind him, stepped right from behind him. She said, hi, Daddy. And she said, Daddy, she said, don't you want to come over here and be with us? And he said, I woke up, fell out of my face down there, got ball and got right with God. Good, good. I feel some of you need to do tonight. Some of you, some of you are hardened Christians. 
been out in the wilderness for about 39 years. <laughs> Some of you need to get off someplace, have a good cry someplace. Get your joy back. Start praising God again. Go on, finish the journey. The best is yet to come. I mean, I try to tell you that, but you don't look very convinced, some of you. <laughs> you look like the worst is coming. The best is yet to come. I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither in the heart of man, the thing that God has prepared for them that love him. Did you ever eat a big meal and then get a good dessert after the thing was over? You know, uh, us preachers traveling down this country, we get, uh, and like I said, I've been through the boot camp. I mean, I've seen it where it was rice and canned tuna for, you know, eight weeks at a time. But after you get out in the work, the Lord pays you back. I've been at home for the fellow sat down and put a platter in front of me just like that. Cut meat without a bone in it. And he said, now this is beef, and this is pork, and he said, this is lobster. And you just help yourself. You come around the end of the meal, and they say, have some more. <laughs> I said, no, I'm stuffed up to my neck. They said, they got dessert coming, and you say, well, that's what I left my neck for. <laughs> <laughs> you never, you, did you ever have them come around and right then the meal, they get down there in the meal, right then the meal, they say, keep your fork, keep your fork. You know what that means? That means something else is coming. But listen, brethren, there's nothing wrong with the way God's treating you right now. I mean, you might like it, may put it rough, but he's, he's treated you pretty good, hasn't he? Well, he's going to treat you better. I mean, keep your fork. You never, you, ne you never have eaten, at, ate, or whatever the word is, but you, you never have eaten, at, or eaten until you've eat, ate, or at, I don't know which one it is, until you've eaten down in a country dinner on the grounds in Alabama, or Tennessee, or Louisiana, one of those places, especially Louisiana, with that rice and crayfish biscuit and uh, seafood gumbo and okra and chicken purlu and pecan pie, man, out of this world, and fried green tomatoes, okra, and pepper sauce. <laughs> that stuff is a foretaste of the marriage of the lamb. <laughs> Reminded me of an old color preacher down there finished one of those dinner in the ground, had a big time there, an old color preacher finished that dinner in the ground and just was full of one of those hot summer days, you know, and you finish drinking that iced tea, you know, and eating that pecan pie and homemade vanilla ice cream, man, oh man. And he went over there after the thing was over and lay down under a tree and folded his hands across his chest and he said, Breath, I done drawed you for the last time. <laughs> And he said, from now on, you can come and go as you see fit. <laughs> <laughs> you ever been long there? You ever been long there? Now listen, listen. The best is yet to come. The Lord treat you all right tonight, and the dessert will be later. You know what the Lord says to you folks here tonight? Keep your fork. Keep your fork. The best is coming. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will bless this message tonight. Now, I pray if your people here tonight that need this message, uh, have ears to hear, they'll hear, and get out of the dumps. Now, I know some of them have pretty good reason to be down the dumps, Lord. Have the blues. Some have rough circumstances tonight. The valley is deep, and the way is long, and the scorpions in the wilderness, and Nothing but rocks and barren land as far as they can see. But they're going home if they're saved. They're your children. And you've got them this far, and you're going to get them the rest of the way. And I pray they might see it and cheer up. And though Jesus is probably some unsafe person who's been sitting here listening to me tonight, and all the hopes downtown, those buildings and money and that job and the bank account and all that life insurance and Red Cross and Blue Cross and retirement and all that mess, and you're going to burn this place, Lord. You said you're going to burn it. May they get home to Canaan and have something real. And have your blessings while they're going. Quit worrying about all this materialistic junk to fool with. Us remain in prayer. A few minutes, head bowed, and eyes closed.